and welcome to Raw Politics, Newsroom's weekly podcast and video chat on the big political issues. I am Newsroom political editor Laura Walters and joining me in Wellington is senior political reporter Mark Dalder. Hi Mark. Hello Laura. And joining us from Auckland is Newsroom co-editor Tim Murphy. Kia ora Tim. Kia ora. Now, today on Raw Politics, we will analyse the deteriorating relationship between Māori communities and this coalition government, and we will take a look at what the future holds for the public service. And to wrap up, as always, we will offer you some recommendations. Aotearoa may well be barrelling towards a race war. At least that's what it's felt like during the past few weeks as tensions rise between the coalition government and Māori communities. This week started with a Ngāpui hikoi to parliament in opposition to the repeal of Section 7AA of the Oranga Tamariki Act. This set the scene for a series of skirmishes across the week over 7AA, Māori wards, gang laws and a minister who edited Te Reo Māori out of a Matariki celebration invitation. There is a lot going on here. It feels like every week there is a new policy that is opposed by Māori uh, across the spectrum. Um, We, of course, should uh, note that we are three Pākehā here um, untangling or disentangling this very complex issue or number of issues, but we are going to give a crack at analysing the politics behind this and where it might or lead. Now, Mark, could we set the scene a little bit with, um, you know, it's probably, there are probably too many pieces of legislation to run through them all or too many policies to run through them all, but can we set a bit of a scene about what's going on at Parliament that is affecting Māori? Yeah, I was um, just jotting down trying to, to list them all. So we've we've got um, the Māori wards legislation, which has now gone through, and councils around the country are now taking votes on whether they want to get rid of their Māori wards or put keeping it to a referendum. Uh, there's the 7AA uh, bill, which removes the kind of mention of the treaty from the Oranga Tamariki Act. Uh, there's gangs legislation, which has a lot of different elements to it, but um, you know, broadly a crackdown on 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 gangs, gang patches, gang members associating, um, who are and, disproportionately Maori. Yeah, people. gangs are, are disproportionately Maori. Um, there's the uh, Marine and Coastal Areas Act, uh, which is the the previous national government's fix to the foreshore and seabed crisis, uh, which is now being reworked after some court decisions have interpreted it maybe more widely than it was originally written. Um, And then there's David Seymour's Treaty Principles Bill, which we haven't got a lot of detail on yet, but that's kind of lurking behind the background, which, which, you know, promises quite a significant shift in New Zealand's constitutional framework uh, and and doesn't seem like it at this, this stage has the support of the other governing parties. But, you know, we just don't know where things will end up. And then outside of the legislation space, there's policies like uh, the use of Tereo by the public sector in terms of their uh, names of agencies um, and uh, a policy to remove mentions of the treaty from other legislation uh, as as and when it comes up. So there's a lot of different things going on. Also kind of more tangentially linked to that, there are um, there have been changes to the child poverty reduction targets. We've just seen this week the um, unemployment figures out and, you know, it's climbed higher for Māori and Pacifica communities. So, you know, we're... We, potentially already seeing some some links in, in other areas broader yeah. than just the, the specific policy. The disestablishment of the Māori Health Authority, there, there are more, it, there's a lot, there's a lot, right? And it, it's it's hard to list them all just off the top of your head. But that, that gives us a little bit of an idea, doesn't it, about um, some of the issues at play here and why there's such strength of feeling in opposition to a lot of these um, policies. And we've seen this week that kind of the the rhetoric, I mean, it's it's been building for a while, these tensions, the inflammatory language, the, the personal attacks. We spoke about this a bit on Raw Politics last week. Um, but things have really fired up this week. We've had a hikoi. Um, we've got uh, threats of, of violence um, against councillors around this Māori wards legislation and act now. Um, the, the party that has been driving through a lot of this policy is telling everyone to kind of dial things back. Tim, I'm really interested in in your thoughts on this, where we've gotten to at this moment, some of the rhetoric, um, and whether, you know, does ACT have a right here to tell people to to turn things down a notch? I mean, didn't David Seymour kind of set the scene for where we are now? Well, politically, he did. 
personally, he probably has a right to seek respectful and uh, less uh, targeted personal um, attacks by people both ways. But politically, he and New Zealand First, who have led this tripartite government in this path uh, largely, uh, they've really set that fire. And I think they can say, well, they haven't indulged in you know, the pettiest or the most personal uh, denigrations, but um, this is taken in a way, and as you say, Laura, we're not Māori, so we, we've got to anticipate this, but from watching, from what, watching and listening to, say, the Māori Party in Parliament, it's being taken personally on behalf of all Māori and iwi and their whānau. And so it's being, the policy changes, and I, I watched Debbie Naruapaka uh, in the general debate this week, and she went as far as to call saying that this, the big one is coming, she said. Uh, we've had these all this list that you just listed of all these legislative and other measures, but the big one is coming. And I think from that she was implying that they will go for the treaty, not just redefining treaty principles. Um, she mentioned ethnocide and went on to explain what that is, that that is the erasion of culture and rights, not erasure of the people uh, physically, if you know what I mean. It was quite specific. So this has been taken deeply personally, this, this policy platform, this um, many-pronged you know, move to roll back and turn back uh, the interpretation, if, if not the actual um, legislative underfounding and the constitutional founding of these things. So look, it's, it is brewing. I don't know race wars ever going to be part of it. I know you didn't mean that literally, but you know, it's, it's going to be tense. And we saw a little example of that in the uh, coverage on TVNZ this week of the Kaipara Council uh, and its vote to remove its Māori ward and things were tense. And that's the sort of thing probably will be re-entering up and down the country as these other measures go through. There's no bad thing to have a active and uh, activist response. That's what politics and policy development and people's rights and fights are. So it's just got to stay within uh, non-violent and within parliament, they're trying to keep it within non-personal denigration to the point of bullying or, or to a point where someone is, is unable to cope. I, I, I found the, the taking, it, taking it personally kind of bit there quite interesting, Tim. And, you know, the government's argument has been, well, both during the campaign from these different parties, but also since, since forming government, that these are decisions based on policy grounds and ideological grounds of, you know, that kind of fundamental liberal democracy perspective, one person, one vote, everyone gets treated the same way, regardless of their heritage, et cetera, et cetera. I think the the reason that there has been such outrage over this latest incident with Paul Goldsmith removing the the Tadeo greetings from the invitation is that that that's that's none of those things, right? That just just feels like personal malice and distaste for Tadeo Maori and perhaps more broadly Maori culture. Taken on its own, maybe it wouldn't be a big deal, but in the context of all this other stuff and the government very strenuously saying, "Look, this has nothing really to do with Maori." It just happens to, you know, impact on Māori disproportionately or be dealing with, you know, all of these Māori-specific and treaty-specific things. But that's based on the policy and the advice we've had from officials, based on our views about, you know, how New Zealand should operate as a democracy. Then you have Paul Goldsmith coming in here and being like, I, I think we should remove from a Matariki invitation the words tēnākwe. Like, it's, it's, it just feels personal, right? It's not just people taking it personally, which isn't what you were trying to suggest, but it, it feels like it it is personal for the government as well. Mm, yeah, it feels that doesn't feel substantive. It feels like virtue signaling or, or why not just take another little, I don't know, jab here because yeah. we can. I mean, the question that I have asked myself a lot this week is, who is asking for these policies? And to be fair, you know, we all exist in our own kind of bubbles or <laughs> um, ecosystems and things like that. But for example, looking at the this repeal of the Section 7AA from the Oranga Tamariki Act, there's no, from what we could see from advice from officials, from regulatory impact statements, there's no um, sound evidential basis for removing this 
section um, for removing this, these cultural considerations and considerations of te tiriti. Uh, from what we can see from the hearings, uh, from, you know, Māori communities and service providers, but also Pākehā, you know, we've had um, Starship Children's Hospital staff and clinicians. Um, we've had a former minister, Tracy Martin, like, you name the person, they have submitted against this repeal. So then you're saying, who has the government spoken to? Who is, you know, there, there aren't people who are also coming out in force saying that they would like to see this repeal or we would like to see um, a lot of these policies. So you start to wonder where has it come from? Where is the evidence underpinning it? And it is, of course, their prerogative to bring in policy or legislation based on ideology. You know, politicians are allowed to do that. But they've also tried to say, well, there's evidence underpinning this. And when you you know, push them a little bit further on that. They say, well, it's anecdotal evidence and it's maybe in one or two cases. So they're trying to kind of have their cake and eat it too. But across all of this, we're not hearing these voices strongly calling out for these policies. So you're wondering, where has it come from? Who has asked for it? And what communities are they actually serving? And in the meantime, it's, it's drumming up this um, division and this rhetoric and this discontent and you wonder how you do move forward constructively and, and improve people's lives when this is kind of the environment that we're operating in. Um, um, can I just disagree with Mark over Paul Goldsmith? Only on this basis. I don't think it's probably Mellis uh, from Paul Goldsmith, who is, after all, reportedly or reputedly or wrongly associated with Nadi Perot. Um, no, I think it's not malice, it'd be my guess. I think it's blockheadedness. I think, you know, here's a thing, bugger that. Nah, we've had too much of this. Let's make a point. Uh, I wouldn't think it was to be malicious, but I'm probably giving him the benefit of the doubt there. And he would say it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter anyway. It's a couple of words, striking out words. It's like taking out yours sincerely or, what you know, all that stuff. But I just think it's it's a point, it's making a point, probably within his own office as much as anything, that this is how I want our, our correspondence to be rather than to be a point to the public generally. And it's probably been a bit of an embarrassment or distraction generally. Um, but to your point, uh, Laura, on 7AA, you know, it's, it's strange this one because it probably is too obvious uh, too obviously prioritising the treaty in consideration of care for um, Tamariki. It, it's quite high up, prominent, and easy to excise, uh, if you know what I mean, in a physical sense in the legal uh, documentation. So it sort of set itself up in some ways for a, an overreaction. It isn't the means to end what we in Newsroom have reported on and what others have reported on are called reverse uplifts, where um, only children with, couldn't be with, uh, say, Pākehā um, foster parents and had to come back to Fanau as a rule because that was already stopped. Um, the, the, the policy of reverse uplifts was, was stopped by the previous minister. Calvin Davis. So it's not needed for that reason. So it's not putting right a obvious kind of overreaction. Though that, that way is, is one of the issues that the government will point to when you ask for why they yes. are doing this. That's what I mean. It, it kind of it's a justification as well. We've had this thing, crazy thing, where no one else can look after Maori kids, and we're going to stop this. But but actually, that was stopped by administrative fiat rather than uh, legislative. So you know, again, it, it just seems to me that. They, they're looking for uh, legislative changes that can remove, you know, prioritising of treaty principles or care, taking into consideration the treaty. And this one's one they think, well, even if they don't see a practical change and benefit in it, it's, it's for them sort of almost a signal. I'm interested in where you both think that this is going to go. You know, the, the people I have been speaking to, Māori communities and um, and other activist groups who are, you know, preparing to organise to oppose the Treaty Principles Bill when the, when the draft bill lands, they are saying that they think this could potentially be the biggest opposition and whatever that means in terms of, you know, protest or hikoi, um, you know, educational uh, outreach, uh, different campaigns by different groups, the, the biggest opposition 
or organised opposition to government policy that we have ever seen. Obviously, you know, we think about the foreshore and seabed um, and things like that when we're thinking about big opposition and, and hekoi and protest. So I'm interested in whether you both think we're going to surpass that level, surpass any opposition we've seen before, or whether you think that this is kind of a moment in time and things might simmer back down, um, you know, when there, when there are fewer linked policies all going through at the same time. Um, well, if I can start, I'd, I'd say it won't be only because it won't pass. Um, and National would surely not go ahead with this given the risk of division that you're identifying. Um, it is broad enough in that it touches enough parts of life and uh, tikanga and just in general uh, culture uh, with all the legislative areas that it would change and all the kind of constitutional um, redefining that it entails. It's broad enough too, but you've got to back that it will not pass. Therefore, it'll cause its flurry and there'll be temporary protesting of some scale, but then I think it will pass. I'm curious, Tim, because the, the treaty principles bill, I, I, I think I, I agree with you, you know, it'll have its first reading, it'll go to select committee, it'll get an immense number of submissions, there will be quite forceful public, you know, uh, in-person submissions and and then National and New Zealand First and Labour and the Greens and Te Pāti Māori will, will vote it down at the second reading. But uh, I, I'm curious about the Marine and Coastal Areas Act changes as well, because that directly touches on the foreshore and seabed issue, which which did, you know, incite such the, those massive protests two decades ago. It, it feels like that, that's gone a little bit under the radar since it was announced a couple of weeks ago by, by Paul Goldsmith, um, who, who presumably didn't, didn't say kia ora at the start of his press stand-up. Or tēnā <laughs> um, But uh, do you think that as that goes through, because it seems like this one really will pass, uh, that will incite a, a similar level of opposition and, and protests that, that the original issue did? Probably not, because the argument here, and, and I must say, I was really surprised to see this in the coalition agreements uh, when they came out in November, December, uh, because it, it's a head scratcher to think who would relitigate the Marine and Coastal Areas Act after National and the Party Māori of the time, the Māori Party at the time, were able to put that big hugely controversial uh, issue into a kind of livable, put it aside form and hope that that will be okay. Uh, but what happened was this Court of Appeal judgment in October, so one month after the Court of Appeal judgment, which I did read a couple of times, and I sort of question whether many people in Parliament have read it, because I've heard some of the uh, takes that people are taking from it. That judgment, that claims for Upnet or Portiki in the in the lower Bay of Plenty. Basically, the Court of Appeal said Parliament's law, the MACA Act of 2011, is it, that that act had a purpose at the front and a clause provision in the middle that clashed. And so they said, we're going to go with the purpose, these two judges of the three, we'll go with the purpose, which was to foster customary rights. So that the judges in that case were saying, if we accept the clause, then virtually nobody will get these rights. And that can't have been what Parliament intended when it said in its purpose, in the front of the Act, this is to foster rights. They also pointed out that when the government of the day went out in consultation before that bill even came in in 2010-11, that their consultations were about fostering customary rights. So they said, it can't be right. This, you've got to, the lower courts need to address this clause in a more uh, flexible and take it in the positive rather than the negative. One judge uh, who ruled the other way said, this makes it far easier for Iwi and Hapu to make these claims and succeed. Uh, and I think his comments and his view is what Shane Jones, uh, New Zealand First, and others have latched onto now and saying, and I've heard Luxon say, this is to restore the bill to what Parliament intended. But two of our fine Court of Appeal judges say, well, Parliament intended two things. So this Parliament is going to say, 
of that parliament's two intentions, we favour this one, which is restrictive, but not to the point, Mark, of going back to Helen Clark's foreshore and seabed bill, which removed it entirely, the right, and, and, and had the, the definition that you know, it was crown ownership not available to others. So isn't, isn't going back to 2003-04, this government's tried to seek a tighter version of what the law says uh, said in 2011. Um, so there will be protests for sure. It's a, it's a, it was an ugly issue. It was an intractable challenge for Chris Finlayson and others who seemed through consultation and some brilliance to find a kind of middle ground. And if this government's trying to restore that Finlayson, you know, um, middle ground, then maybe it, it works. But if it does restrict things too much beyond what the courts have identified, then it, it becomes a real issue. And no doubt Māori claimants and Māori lawyers will be viewing it that it's going backwards beyond what that act intended. Sorry, long explanation, but that, that's going back all those years. Tim, um, before we move on, I wanted to kind of bring things full circle and ask um, you both what you think Christopher Luxon, as the Prime Minister, his role is in all of this. As we've pointed out, he's you know not supporting the treaty uh, principles bill to go further. He's spoken about the um, potential for too much division there. We're also he keeps talking about dialing down the rhetoric. We've just got to dial down the rhetoric. Um, I wonder whether you think that he is doing enough to make sure that happens um, to, in terms of maybe sequencing their their policy program, um, talking to his his ministers and things, you know, to David Seymour, to Winston Peters, to, to others who are making these comments. Is he hitting the balance right here or could he be doing more to ensure that, you know, this doesn't get out of hand? I think he's probably doing the right job for his position, which is the leader of the National Party trying to hold this three-party coalition together, having been elected on a, a surge of, we could say at least from the voting public, anti-Maori sentiment. Um, you know, this is the same party that that just a couple of years ago was scaremongering about her pua pua. And the the person who is doing that is now the Attorney General, right? So um, it's it's... He, he he's not in the same position as say John Key was when he came into into government. He is it, at the head of a party that is less comfortable with all things Maori, and I think he himself doesn't have the understanding of the impact of these policies on Maori communities and the sentiment within Maori communities. Mm -hmm. Way back when the government first formed last year, and he just met all these questions from from journalists about the protests that he, that he might expect with complete kind of confusion. He he just did not think people would be opposed to what he was doing. And and, and now, you know, we've had Ngāpui walk out of the Iwi Chairs Forum meeting with him, you know, just last week. And he still sometimes portrays confusion as to why people won't just listen to the very common sense reasons behind his policies, which just is part of being a politician. But in particular, you know, he, he just clearly doesn't have uh, insight into the, the kind of dominant sentiment among Māori. I think he's a means to an end guy. Uh, he enunciates the end as improving opportunity, jobs, health, education for Māori, uh, for lifting up young Māori, and this is why they're doing all these things. So he's trying to broad brush paint it as we're all looking for improvement here and all we have at our heart, the intention to improve situations for Māori. Uh, I think Mark's right, as leader of the National Party and Prime Minister of this coalition, there's little choice but to, having agreed to these various measures, to let them run, but to try and paint them as we're doing it for positive reasons ultimately, even if you don't see it, even if you don't accept it, we've got your best interests in heart, at heart. Uh, and I think, look, I've not been noticing Chloe Swarbrick for the Greens trying to find him out for his ignorance and her view of uh, the treaty and of Section 7AA by asking him for definitions of them in the House each day. You know, how would you define uh, Section 2, uh, so uh, Part 2 and Part 3 of the treaty and so on? And, and, and I think those kind of tactics don't probably help because the people watching and listening probably think, well, that's just gotcha catch you out sort of thing. Um, her point, I guess, is to show that he is suffering from what Mark has said, where he's not entirely clear, not not entirely sort of footsure on things 
uh, race relations and treaty. But it does seem to me that that's probably a bit of a dead end for her to keep pursuing. Uh, so, yeah, as I say, I think Luxon's point is that as Prime Minister, I'm going to paint it as all of us going for a positive, but we believe these are the right ways to do it. Public Services Minister Nicola Willis has issued a new letter of expectations to the public service. And our audience question for this week is, what does that mean for the future of the service? Now, Mark, let's start with you. Um, could you kind of outline a little bit about what this what this letter means and how it might change the direction of the, the public service? Yeah, it's, it's just two pages, the letter, but there's a lot in there that addresses a few different things that have come up uh, since the government came to power on the public service. So at the very top of the letter, it talks about, you know, making sure that the uh, headcount growth in the public services is sustainable, that they're staying within budgets. Basically, they don't want to... Um, have made all these cuts in, in the most recent budget and then see the public sector balloon again. Discussion around salary uh, in there as well and making sure that that you know, is, is at a, kept at a reasonable level. Um, avoiding things like having to do back pay because it took you so long to negotiate a new collective agreement uh, that you've got you know, this big kind of uh, one-time expense suddenly come up eight months after your deadline. So getting your engagement on that started early. On things Māori, there was also a, a touch on uh, what to do with these uh, sort of um, performance payment. Yeah, the, these bonuses that that in, are in some public sector contracts for people who speak te reo. And it, it kind of backed down from Nicola Willis's earlier position that, that she'd get rid of those. Now it says they may well be appropriate. Um, it depends on the context and it's a case by case sort of situation, but other bonuses should be limited where possible. Uh, there's some discussion around things like remote working and, and flexible hours and, and there's a lot in there, but those are, I think, maybe the highlights. Mm. And and beyond that, Tim, as well, you know, N Nicola Willis is, this is just one part of a bigger program, isn't it? Um, and, and things that she's signaling to the public service that they need to change. Yeah, I was taken by a thing they've sort of announced uh, by the back door in some ways called performance plans for departments and ministries, which the cabinet office has given out a circular over. And this is basically telling them that you won't get anything more in your budget, in your vote next year, apart from uh, priorities, high priorities of the government, that you must stay within your budget uh, figures for any pay increases, which if there's going to be any pay increases, suggests that therefore your salary costs will reduce in another way by having fewer and fewer people getting the salaries. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about how, taking a medium term view of how your department will stay within its budget line uh, because she had told Parliament that the, the shocks and sort of sudden um, problems that some departments have experienced, or at least National is saying they've experienced, uh, because there were just so little uh, view on the medium term. It was all just next year's budget sort of uh, lolly scramble. So that they're making departments take a longer approach and also a more disciplined approach. And it will mean further cuts, uh, far more substantial cuts maybe over overall uh, than so far. We also know that... Um this government has a big ambitious policy program. They're moving at pace, which we have spoken about at length um, on this podcast. And so we're, we're essentially seeing a public service minister and a government asking the public service to do more and do it faster with less. Um, and I was very interested in the, the thing that she's signalled in the past, or Nicola Willis has signalled in the past around that performance-based pay. You know, we need to get these... Um, policy priorities out there. We also want to hit all of these government targets, you know, these big nine government targets that we've set. Um, but you will be doing it with less money. You will be doing it with fewer people. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of interested with all of that, whether incentivising people through performance pay is actually going to do anything. Will that help them hit their, hit their targets? Or are they just going to find that they don't have the people, the resources, the time to actually do what they need to do to hit these targets to to create this policy. Um, 
and I think again speaking of of evidence versus um, ideology you know we heard at the estimates uh, hearing just after the budget when Nicola Willis came to the committee that Labor had said you know we looked at performance based pay and we didn't find any, any evidence for it actually improving outcomes or improving performance so Nicola Willis might have heard something else there but I'd It'll be interesting to see, I think, whether it actually results in anything better from the public service. She would say the evidence is that after six years of labour, there's a whole lot more being spent and no better service to the public. So there's the only evidence you need is the real life apocryphal um, story, you know. Uh, I will say, you know, newsroom pays me by the word, and that does lead to longer and lo- longer articles. <laughs> so, you know, there could be a, a you got to be careful about your incentives. I guess is 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 where we we end up with that. And and then there's also the question of, you know, if if, if that's the carrot, is there a stick as well? Will people have pay cuts if they um, if they're not performing or they're underperforming? And I didn't. And correct me if I missed. I didn't see anything specifically noting that in her letter of expectation. But it's also not something that she has ruled out when. She she's been asked on it. Let's wrap things up with some recommendations, something you have watched, read or listened to this week that you enjoyed. Tim, let's start with you. Well, I'm going to flatter you again, Laura. Um, Laura did a marvellous piece this week on Newsroom uh, looking at senior public service and Crown agency figures implicated in the uh, Royal Commission into abuse and state care for the roles basically uh, in, in the administration and the legal processes, and it's well worth a read. Thanks, Tim. I'll pay you later. Um, (laughs) My recommendation for this week is a listen. It is um, the New York Times daily podcast episode on Tim Waltz, uh, Kamala Harris's running mate. It's called Harris Chooses Waltz, and it's a a guide to the career politics and sudden stardom of the governor of Minnesota, now vice president, um, running mate for Kamala Harris. Mark, what have you got for us? I've also got a New York Times article. Mine is on the climate politics in the the Petro state of Azerbaijan, uh, which is hosting the next global climate summit this year. Um, it's an interesting read about the the stuff that's that's brewing in, in a country that's so reliant on oil and gas, but but now has to face and, and front the world on on climate issues. Uh, and I'm going there also in November, so good to get a sense of what things are like. Can I just ask, where have all you Johnny-come-lately Tim Walsh people been? I've been a student of his politics for all of about 72 hours. <laughs> Me too, now that I've listened to that episode of The Daily. <laughs> I've been a Twitter follower of Tim Walsh for the better part of a year, so I really was you know, quite, quite early on. That's it from Raw Politics for this week. Thank you to our producer, Trent Doyle, and all our readers, listeners, and viewers. Please send any burning questions you may have to laura.walters at newsroom.co.nz. You can find us here next week on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts.